For the panel today um, is Mike Robbins, and he is the Merc he's the EMA for Mercer County, Ohio. Uh, first, just to let you know, I am not a scientist. <laughs> do not plan on ever being a scientist. I will not do the math. So, uh, what they kind of asked me to do, because I'm not a weather person, uh, what I did learn, two of the best things that have ever happened with my partnership that I've got with the National Weather Service is one, there's a FEMA course that is severe weather and flooding. It's a three and a half day course. I think uh, wonderful it just takes you through all the products you can get from the National Weather Service and the second thing and Ken Haydu are you still here if you ever get rid of chat I will hunt you down you've heard that chat is the best tool I have I very rarely call the weather service anymore because it's in there they're giving me the information I need and the media meteorologists ask some very good questions that I would never even think about asking and those answers are there so I'm on there a lot you guys see me in the room anytime something's around you know so it chimes so it lets me know somebody said something and I'll jump into North Webster's and in Indianapolis once in a while too this is what happened on 27 28 um, I wasn't quite first I was the first big tornado uh, and it actually took me quite a while till I realized all the tornadoes that were happening down in Dayton because I was pretty well occupied after 10.02. Um, and what I'm going to do is to just take you through the timeline of what EMA did. And this in the poor mic because, Andy, I did do more hours than you. <laughs> when you put the 80 hours in that week, I said, I would have loved 80 hours that week. But... Um, this in the poor mic is just EMA offices are pretty small normally. Uh, you even look at Montgomery County. Jeff has, I think, four people in their office, right, Sam? And, four County Jeff. <coughs> yes. So uh, that's not a lot. I have me, an administrative assistant. I actually had an intern, I Cassidy, uh, who made the mistake of calling me right after tornado hit, said anything. I said, get your butt in there. In here. I don't think I said butt. <laughs> So my timeline, at 20 after 8, we went under a tornado watch, and I normally come in the office at that point. So uh, if the weather's getting close at all, and at that time I'd already had some information. I was at home watching. Uh, I was in the chat room at home before I went in the office, knew what was firing up in Indiana, uh, knew it wasn't going to be great evening. I didn't expect what we had. Um, and, yeah, I think it was five till we got the warning. Uh, might have been a little earlier than that. That's what I had written down. There could have been a little lag in what I wrote down. At that time, I really did not think it was going to be that bad, although I'd had a lot of communication with Jay County, Indiana's EMA director, which it, that weather kind of bounced over Jay County, but she was well aware of what happened to west of her around Mount Pillar, Indiana. So Jessica Hooten, their EMA director, was giving, feeding me a lot of information. Uh, and at 10 after, at 2 after 10 is when the tornado hit. Um, it was soon after the tornado hit, because I'm lagging a little bit behind on my computer, I could see the debris ball, I could read way, radar enough to know what a debris was. Still was not aware on how bad it was in the county and the city of Salina. My office sits about six blocks from the heaviest damaged area within the city. I'm at the edge of the fairgrounds, which is full of trees. Uh, there's enough lights out there until it actually put all the power out in Salina that the trees were not blowing very hard right in that area and the tornado was hitting six blocks away destroying homes so uh, you know it wasn't bad enough that I headed to the restroom which is our tornado shelter in our office so what I did between 
that and two o'clock in the morning. First thing I did was get on the phone, make some phone calls, uh, and this didn't happen right after. Our first uh, thing I got that knew it was bad was they got a call for an ambulance run with somebody trapped in their basement and hurt. The squad got close to the area and they radioed and said, we cannot get there because of debris and wire stem. And that was my first indication that something was wrong. So uh, the fire chief is blowing up my phone at this point. Uh, I think I called Ohio EMA first and called the watch office. Ohio EMA has a 24 seven watch office, called them. Uh, requested Southwest Regional Staff, which Sam Reed is here, uh, but Phil Clayton ended up coming up, his supervisor, headed up my way and Phil called. Uh, as soon as I could, I started in Web EOC an incident. I didn't get a lot written in there. I started the incident very quickly, uh, which that helps everybody at State EMA can see that. The supervisor, uh, the regional staff can see that as they're headed this way. Uh, the other thing that happened was our dispatch did not have time for any media calls. Those came to me. They told them. Plus, a lot of the media, um, some of the media is left now, and I, the meteorologist I love. Sometimes media gets a little frustrating. They will never get rid of your cell phone number if you ever had it. <laughs> so I went back several weeks later, and on my cell phone, I can track all my calls. From the time the tornado hit till 7.30 on Tuesday, 7.30 p.m. on Tuesday when I went home, I took 132 calls on my cell phone. So that was either me making it or receiving. That didn't include text. That did not include the office phone. Did you ever count, Cassidy? Because you answered all the office phone calls. My administrative assistant lives in the area that was hit by the tornado. She was not hit. She could not get out of her neighborhood because of debris and wires down. In fact, Phil came up from Butler County, and he got there just barely after Cheryl, my administrative assistant, got there. It took her that long to get out of the neighborhood, well over an hour. And then they had to drive way north of town to come back in. Uh, power did go out all over the city of Salina. city of Salina runs their own electrical power. They don't have a power plant. They buy power, but they are their own electrical, municipal electric system. So that whole, and that goes outside the city of ways, that whole system went down. Uh, but they, are, they got some uh, help in fairly quickly, and 75% of the power within the city of Salina area was back on by 3 a.m. So I thought that was pretty good. Uh, through all the, the response went very well. I had very little to do with response on that. Our plans kicked in. They started a staging area for responders at our sheriff's office, which is outside the city's line, a large parking lot there. So fire and EMS, we got a countywide EMS system. They started there, so Salina Fire had their ambulances and fire trucks started that. Everybody else reported there first and then was dispatched. Uh, Cold Water Fire Chief ran that staging area for fire. Our EMS director, county EMS director, who we share an office with, county EMS, was out there and ran the ambulances. Our 10 county ambulances handled all the injuries and taking care of responders for this response. We had three other runs covered by either Van Wert County or All Glaze County ambulances that everyday runs had nothing to do with tornado they handled at that point. Uh, when Phil got there, he helped a lot. He helped write the incident in Web EOC, helped answer phones. Um, things started slowing down phone-wise maybe midnight I'm thinking things started easing out. First I ever got on the scene was about two o'clock in the morning. I had to go out to talk to the mayor because I couldn't get him to come into the EOC. In a small county, does everybody know what an EOC, Emergency Operations Center? You get to larger counties and they can bring people in no matter what the incident. 
I had all 10 of my fire chiefs were busy. I couldn't find a fire chief to come in. And, and we're used to that. So we had people in there answering phones. I had contact with them. But I really needed the mayor to come in, but I had to go find him. And, and he was doing a nice job out there, uh, you know, being a support to his fire department and his police chiefs. And, um, anyway, they... Uh, So, 2 in the morning, Phil Clayton from Ohio EMA and I actually made it out to the scene. Uh, at that point, our Slime Police Department has a mobile incident command post. They dropped that in, there's a church, the First Church of God, uh, yeah, First Church of God that's right there at the entrance of where most of the damage was. They dropped it in their parking lot, so that became the command post and kind of the central area we were working from and thank you Pastor Flack who dealt with that for several days afterwards but uh, we kind of overtook his church and his parking lot there for a while but uh, he, he was pretty amiable with it. So um, Phil and I tried to do some damage assessment. It is really dark out. We had about three light towers out there but not enough to do damage assessment. So we finally, we talked to the mayor, told him he needed to come in and sign the declaration, uh, the proclamation of emergency. That actually happened the next afternoon because I couldn't get him to come in. But uh, we finally went back to the office, sent you guys home, it was about three in the morning, Cassidy. Phones had kind of stopped except for just response type things. But by two in the morning, the fire departments had searched every damaged property and any on either side of them that wasn't damaged twice. So they were calling it done till daylight, then after daylight they did it a third time. That went very well. That was amazing. They actually knew just a little after midnight that we had, that Mr. Hanna had expired. Uh, Probably, I was trying to get the mayor to make that official announcement. It was his to make, not mine. He wanted to wait early on. He said at 9 o'clock in the morning he'd do a press conference. Uh, of course, everybody knew there was a death at that point. You know, everybody was out of their house. Everybody was milling around. So um, that didn't happen. I was, I said, don't announce the name, just announce it. But that didn't happen. But that things you work through. So... Um, from three in the morning on, Phil and I were making plans. I mean, Phil was already hitting me long-term recovery committee, and we'll mention that a little bit. Uh, it's in a couple more slides, but uh, there were some successes there. 0900, we had the press conference, and, and the name's different. He went by Dale. His real first name was Melvin Hanna. So uh, McCall's slide and mine's a little different there, but it was the same gentleman. Uh, and at 0630 is when Phil and I went out and started doing damage assessment. That was frustrating. This is a small town. I was born and raised in Salina, so was my wife. My dad was fire chief for Salina Fire Department. My mom was a public health nurse. You know, I knew everybody. So Phil would get a whole side of a street done for a block, and I'd be on the second house because I knew everybody. And it was really hard to get through. And when we got out, on the road where Mr. Hanna died, uh, that was difficult because we were about three houses down and a young couple that lived there both graduated with my oldest son. And the wife, Ashley, and my oldest son, Brian, had been friends since preschool. So Ashley had spent a lot of time at my house over the years and stuff. Well, she came up to me, it was their car. Oh. That and she was having a rough time of course I was having a rough time then. so uh, I think sometimes in a small community sometimes this kind of stuff's a lot rougher um, so I spent you know 45 minutes at their house before I could move on but um, you know just going um, survey team I was used to I mean, I mean, I've been kind of tornado central now, 2011, April tornado, EF2, destroyed a grocery store and several other businesses, big damage, a few houses. 2017, just, uh, yeah, just 
two years before this, a November tornado, uh, destroyed a Dollar General, took the roof off a large manufacturing plant. Uh, I was used to you guys getting there probably next morning normally. You know, it started at 9 in the morning. Well, they told me 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So we had plenty to do that morning. Phil and I did a lot of damage assessment, had to thing. We get there, and Todd, I need to apologize to Todd. I, I used to two, three people coming along on the survey, and I get one. And I was tired by this time. I butt was dragging. Phil had gotten called to Montgomery County. So Sam's counterpart in the northwest region came down. Anita came down because Phil thought I needed a babysitter, and he was right. Um, and at this point, neighbor and EMA directors had their own problem. The ones that I usually count on, uh, All Glaze County, Troy Anderson, Dark County, Mindy Saylor, her planner, Josh, coming up, but they both had tornadoes. And All Glaze County was still working from flooding that had happened a couple weeks before that. So. Um, I had plenty of offers for help later on. I still had the Superman on my chest and kept turning them down. And so I finally got over that. But we went out and, you know, you guys need that detail. And I'm going, yeah, let's get this moving because eventually I want to go home and go to bed. But until 7.30. And, and Anita left. I was going to leave at 5, and then we had storms come in again. So I stayed till 7.30 till those were passed. So 7.30, that's when I went home. I went home, put a little bit of food in me, went to bed, woke up about 2 in the morning, took a shower, I was back in the office at 3. So I couldn't sleep anyway. Damage assessment's very important. The state is yelling at me the next day. We need damage assessment. And, so, and, and that, that is important. That is EMA's job. Our damage assessment for private damage is different than what the insurance industry does. We are never looking at money in that case. We are looking at degrees of damage. So destroyed or major damage homes, we had 51 homes that were either major damage or destroyed. One business was destroyed and 12 apartment units were destroyed. Minor damage, we had 53 homes with minor damage. I'm going to explain this. Minor damage to FEMA standards would not be minor damage if it was your home. Okay, I'll explain this in the next slide. And two businesses with minor damage. Affected, Phil and I quit counting. In fact, when FEMA came a week later, they quit counting affected because we had hundreds affected. You know, which, which is just, you might have windows broke, uh, spouting down. You would be missing the siding off one outside of your house, and that's just affected to FEMA, because structurally you can still live in it. So here's FEMA, and I'm not going to go over all this. Here's FEMA. But if you look at uh, minor damage, you could be missing half your roof as long as the rafters themselves were there. That is minor damage to FEMA. Is that minor damage in your house? But what they're looking at in a fairly short time, if you can get a contractor within two, three days, they could get that covered and you're back in your house. So FEMA is looking longer term. Who's going to be out of their house for how long? So uh, we, we had, and I forget the numbers now, what, was, what we had as destroyed and what we had as major, but it was pretty close to what FEMA had. They, they were very complimentary on the damage assessment we did. Insurance decided to uh, tear down a lot of houses we as major just because it was cheaper. I'm seeing you shake your head, yes. It was cheaper to fix, you know, tear them down and fix them. And a big holdup as people were rebuilding, a lot of insurance adjusters were in, and they just weren't sure, and they needed uh, structural engineers. Well, it was hard enough to get enough assurance adjusters. They brought them in from quite a ways away, uh, but structural engineers, there was a month wait to get a structural engineer to some of these. Uh, you know, there's just not enough of those guys around. So, but those totals were pretty close. Like I said, we had 51 homes, and out of those, um, half of them are at least, half of those are rebuilt as far as they're up, they're under cover, 
not all those are the people back in them yet. And the only thing holding it up really from a lot of these people is there just not enough contractors to get them all ready. Go through a couple pictures. That is a cell phone tower. <laughs> and the interesting thing with that tower is that was an, I don't know if I can say brand names, that was an AT&T tower. I have Verizon on my phone. It affected me greatly when that was down. Um, and it wasn't just jammed because it did that. It took them about, uh, this happened on Monday night, I think Wednesday afternoon they brought in a portable tower, AT&T did, cleared it up. So it wasn't the volume of calls right after the tornado, even though I'm Verizon, they must share tower. I, I don't understand all that, but a tower going down in your area can make a difference even if it's not your carrier. Just a couple damage pictures here. Um, these are along Fairground Road. <coughs> the tornado actually started. The first damage we had, it took the top off. Uh, we're farm country. We're the number one agricultural county in the state. Have been for a long time. Uh, but city of Salina is the only city. We have several villages. Salina is about 10,000 people. 41,000 in the county. It took the tops off of two concrete, the metal tops off of two concrete silos. It was the first damage we had. Came in uh, Bunker Hill Road and then Mud Pike 118. It actually took one house and took the wall about three inches off foundation. Didn't see that till you really looked down that wall. It was hard to see. They actually did get that house fixed. And then going in Mud Pike, not too far to the east, is when we started seeing. Uh, major damage on some homes. At this point, they were still uh, spaced out, out in the country fairly. Two homes destroyed it right next to each other, just just the east of 118, but then it was, you know, house here, house there. Um, these are along, you can tell it's a farm field along Fairground Road, which the tornado just came right in Fairground Road. And so you were in quite a ways before it actually became the city of Salina. So, uh, on the north side of the road, it was farm fields behind them. So these homes were probably most of them built 50s or 60s, some later. As you got closer to town, some of them were built later. Debris everywhere. You know, there's a house totally destroyed. And this one, I'm not sure how to use the pointer. So. Look here. <laughs> See that? That is a china cabinet. <laughs> Not one pane of glass broke, <laughs> and nothing inside the china cabinet was broke. Nothing even knocked over. <laughs> now, how do you destroy a house like that? <laughs> move it, you can tell, move it off the foundation. And that china, now the china cabinet <clears throat> was fastened to the wall. But, how that happens, I'm not sure. Um, and we got to give him some props. That that is Phil Clayton there uh, from Ohio EMA. Phil was going to be here today and couldn't make it. Um, doing damage assessment. I am terrible taking pictures to start with. I forget I have a camera in my pocket. But I didn't. I had to steal most of these pictures from other people because once again, while I was doing damage assessment, I knew everybody. And it was, you know, our uh, the head nurse of our emergency department at Mercer Health Community Hospital. Her house was totally destroyed, and I worked with Jenny all the time. We're on every committee in the county together, so you know, spent 20 minutes at Jenny's house. So there's Rick McCoy. Some of you know Rick. He is the EMA director in uh, Van Wert County. He didn't have any damage. He was down here that day. Uh, he did some of the damage assessment for us. He actually worked very hard on that track, so when the weather service got here, he went along with us to take them. He also, all the drone pictures you will see, Rick took and gave to me. He stole Cassidy from me after the 9 o'clock press conference because she wanted to go do damage assessment with Mr. McCoy. And I understood that, and that was fine. That's, that's your passion. That's what you want to do. So. 
This is the section in Salina that was hit hardest. This was a very new, most of these houses were less than 10 years old, most of them $250,000 houses and up. So very well built. Drainage pond there, the fire department actually came in almost a week later and their divers, I don't know if you ever heard of Grand Lake St. Mary's, the toxic lake, we were ground zero for the blue-green algae outbreak. So uh, we do have a dive team, Salina Fire does. Uh, the divers went and cleaned a bunch of debris out of that pond. And that just gives you some idea. The tornado path at the widest was about 250 yards, and it was mostly through this area, through, along uh, Fairground Road and in here, where it first hit, it was like four houses wide. It was destroying two and then pretty good damage on either side, and it did get narrow as it went. A lot of debris and I'm showing you the amount of debris and this has nothing to do with their EMA director in Mercer County our debris in the city of Salina was cleaned up by Thursday afternoon at 4 o'clock it was done uh, hundreds and hundreds of volunteers that we didn't even have to ask for they were friends and friends of friends so I was getting calls the next weekend we had groups Boy Scout groups want to come in and help, and I had to turn them away. I have no debris for you to clean up anymore. So, now public damages, because we're also doing that. And, and it really surprised me that we got a presidential declaration for individual assistance. Wind events usually do not, in my experience, don't get presidential declarations because insurance always goes first, comes first, and most people have insurance for wind events. Uh, they don't for floods all the time, so we're used to getting individual assistance for a big flood event. And probably we would not have, it was what happened in Montgomery County is what tripped that. And without that, we found no homeowners that uh, did not have insurance we had a lot of them that were underinsured. And that's where SBA came in and they really did help some people. We had $1.8 million of SBA loans, uh, which at that time I think was 2.9% they were giving, uh, or 1.9. One, okay, I want them to rewrite mine and they wouldn't. Because they could rewrite their mortgage too. They had to have the first, and not everybody will take all those loans. They approve them for as much as they're capable of. And, but you're not really taking the loan to actually draw down on that. So, um, but public damages, emergency protective actions. So that is overtime for the fire department, EMS, um, all those type things. Um, so a lot of overtime in there, damage to equipment, although I may have that. Public utilities, like I said, the city of Salina has utilities. Now, some of this, they did have insurance per pole. It did not near cover it. Uh, but just a little bit of what um, they had. Uh, they, they had to replace 35, 40-foot electrical poles, 17,000 feet of wire, uh, replaced, 4,000 feet of wire repaired, 28 transformers replaced, uh, 1,750,000 1, pounds of debris was removed, and 625 uh, uh, dump truck loads of brush was removed, so that one, the other was just debris from the homes and there were 35 flat tires on emergency <laughs> equipment. Uh, I think I might have been the only vehicle that was back there a lot my old 99 county pickup truck I never had a flat they had six flats on the ambulances um, which didn't quite reach the threshold with FEMA to even replace them so our EMS director does bug me about that. You go money for everybody but me. Because <laughs> tires on squads are not cheap. And three of them she had to replace. Three of them could be fixed and three of them she had to replace. 
uh, equipment damage, that's the tires and some other equipment that was damaged. Uh, and debris removal. State and our county removed their tipping fees for debris from the tornado. That helped a lot. Tipping fees in most counties can be as much as the landfill actually charges. Tipping fees are basically a tax. You know, it's something politicians call a tax, so they don't have to call it a tax. But, uh, and, uh, and some of it stays in the county. It pays for the solid waste program and some recycling. So that's how much. 75% of that through FEMA did come back to the county. That takes a while. Th this tornado, as far as paperwork, didn't close out for me till I think it was the first week of December. And I don't think they're done in Dayton yet, are they? No. I don't think. But... Uh, with ours, I think the last one, the City Salina, closed out the first week of December. So the paperwork was done on that. Uh, we did EOC briefings. Like I said, I don't have anybody sitting there all the time. I had lots of, uh, after that first night when there were just a few of us, had we got a good medical reserve corps through our health department. They came in and helped answer phones, that type of thing. So we do briefings. Uh, at that point, I had never thought, even though I live in the farm community, about the farmers. Other tornadoes, we've had more tornado damage in the county before that. In the 2017, we had two tornadoes, and that one actually and it had a lot of debris, but it wasn't as wet, and the farmers could take their equipment out and pick it up. This was very wet at this time. They couldn't, so one of our commissioners mentioned that, and our soil and water took that by the horns. So the fo by the following Tuesday, so a week and one day afterwards, the farm fields were clean and the rest of the county, the areas of the county besides the city were all done. So all our debris was actually taken care of in, a, in eight days. Uh, and we did more damage assessment uh, after Todd was there. The following Saturday I actually found two more homes on, three more homes on two roads farther east. So I'd taken some pictures, sent him a map, and he didn't have to come back out. They just extended that path a couple more miles. Long-term recovery committee wasn't really on my radar. Phil Clayton from Ohio EMA kept poking me. So the Thursday after the tornado, we had the meeting, and that was really a godsend. I put that together and kind of stepped back at that point. They put together a wonderful pamphlet. We had lawyers that were willing to help sit down for no charge and help people work through their insurance if they're having trouble. And, and just some things I figured out, the people that had a local insurance agent seemed to have an easier time than the people that just bought insurance off the internet. Not that those companies were bad, but those local agents would be an advocate for them. Plus, there were people on Tuesday afternoon already had $5,000 or more checks in their hand that their local agent could write that check. It would come off the top when they were done. So, And that helped a lot of need of people because our businesses were not hit. We had one business destroyed, which was a, a seamless spouting business. And we had two others damaged, but not that it put them out of business. But our Walmarts, our Menards, all those places were fine once they got power back and they had that by 3 in the morning. So, the, you know, the availability was for them to go replace their things and they had the money to do it. Now, uh, recovered that. Um, I don't know why I put that back in the office. That was probably my normal time coming in at this. I'd be back at 5. And I couldn't sleep anyway. I'm a morning person anyway. I'm up still 4.30 in the morning. But I was waking up earlier, had my shower, and I was coming in at 5. You're not a morning person, are you? Is that what you're saying, Cassidy? <laughs> you're not a morning person? Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, okay, it was on the 31st. I actually went home that day at 4.30, the earliest I had been home since the tornado. I was actually going to sit down with my wife and had supper, and I did. And at 7.37, our central dispatch calls me to report a plane crash. That was a crop dusting plane. Um, dumped about 100 gallons of jet A fuel in a creek. <laughs> I, most EMAs do the hazardous material, do the local emergency planning committee. 
uh, for the county, and even the dispatcher, Stephanie, had called me, and I'd fallen asleep in the chair watching TV. We had supper and everything, and I think she could tell she woke me up, and she goes, Mike, I'm sorry, but our protocol say if we have a plane crash, I have to call you, and I'm, what? And then she was said it was crop duster. This is the third crop duster plane we've had wrecked since I've been in the EMA. Like, he walked away, although the squad hauled him, he was hurt, but he could walk away from it. Um, but where I got home, thought at a decent time, it was like midnight when I got home that night again. Uh, Mercer County is also one of those counties. We have three U.S. congressmen. Our, our county is split into three. So we have Warren Davison, Bob Latta, and Jim Jordan that were all standing in my office on the 29th. Uh, the actual congressman, Bob Latta, was there first night, met Bob Latta several times. He used to be a county commissioner. He knows how counties work very well. Uh, I hadn't met Warren Davidson before that. I had met Jim Jordan before that. Uh, Governor DeWine also came to the county that afternoon. I was a little tied up. I did not get to go meet with the governor, but the mayor and the sheriff did. That was fine. Um, Butler County sent me, thanks to Phil, sent me an incident management team, just a small one. I started having a donations management problem, and I really didn't, and, and Phil was saying it really wasn't a problem, and it really wasn't at that time. I, my brain wasn't working, and I thought they were going to be here for two days and take care of this. They wrote a plan in about two hours, handed it to me, and left, and I had like three people come make phone calls. It wasn't a problem. It became a problem actually the following weekend. I had people bringing me water from everywhere. We actually ended up, I mean, at this point, when I thought I had a problem, we had maybe 200 cases of water. We took care of that the next day. I had people bring me water from 10. I never needed any, to begin with, our water was never out. And Walmart would have given me every bit of water I needed. You know, they gave it, we'd opened a shelter the first night. Only had three people there, but we opened a shelter the first night. They would have, all I needed was a phone call, and you got to give some facts and figures once in a while. It was easy. Uh, but people want to bring you stuff. Now I'm going to preach. <laughs> I'm going to do this art. Spread this out to everybody you know. Everybody wants to help in a disaster. You never, ever collect stuff for a disaster unless you know two things. One, you know what you're collecting is needed. And two, you have arranged with somebody on the other end to take and distribute that. Just bringing stuff in that's not needed and dropping it off some is not helping. It is a hindrance. Do not do it. I'm telling you, I don't care whether it's a hurricane, whether it's in Timbuktu, you don't do it. Money works better. And even money became a problem. I had a radio station and the chamber collecting money, and I had uh, Keith Wenning, who was a pro football player. He's never a star, but he was a star at Ball State quarterback and he's from Mercer County he did a GoFundMe page found out they couldn't do anything with the money they couldn't give it to an individual if I give you more than six hundred dollars I have to issue you a 1099 unless I'm a private nonprofit uh, so the rotary did step up and take care of that uh, our local rotary through the they use the rotary internationals blanket and they could do that and they're willing to do that in the future if that's a problem so I'm done preaching about that. Uh, FEMA and SBA came for their damage assessment on the 5th. Took them eight hours. Once again, a day I thought they didn't get there till noon. So it was eight o'clock before they left. So it was nine o'clock by the time I got home. Uh, we had another long-term recovery committee meeting and it really grew. I'm not gonna spend time on that. I'm gonna run out of time. So, cause I'm almost out of time already. Uh, Senator Sherrod Brown did a roundtable meeting. He's uh, state senator for Ohio in Montgomery County. And why politicians always want to do stuff late afternoon or in the evening, I'm not sure as I've tried to date. And, and I don't want to harp on the politicians because I'm telling you, they all really care. You could tell. They were there because they wanted what was best. And I really think the representatives and Senator Brown actually helped us get that. I think they were putting a lot of pressure on FEMA 
to get that declaration, and it did help a lot of people. And I don't want to miss, because I'm going to miss somebody, so somebody knows probably our state auditor, Keith Faber. He was around, but Keith Faber lives in Salina, and he was a U.S. representative, he was a senator, he was president of the state senate one time. So I'm used to Keith being around. You know, he's with the mayor. He was on the mayor's shoulder most of the night. So when I was doing this, I forgot Keith, but Keith's always there. So he wouldn't be too mad at me for forgetting him. Uh, federal declaration for INPA. Uh, PA was announced later. That takes a little while to get that. But on the 18th, and that's pretty darn quick for FEMA. Uh, that doesn't happen that quick usually. And like I said, I think the Congress people had a lot to do with that. Um, Community relations, if you've ever been in a county where they've had a federal declaration, FEMA sends people out to actually go door to door in the area, tell them how to sign up, could actually sign them up. They were carrying iPads and they could sign them up. But of course, when you sign up, you need your social security number and stuff. And what do we tell everybody? Never give anybody that. Even though they had FEMA codes on them, they had photo IDs. The local police knew they were there, Sheriff's Department knew that they got the police called on them four or five times every day. <laughs> and the cops have to go out every time. And they said, oh, Lisa, it's you. Okay, but we need to. They were doing their job and it got interesting. Uh, PA damage assessment team here on the 26th. We got the declaration, so you have to set up a disaster recovery center. What is it like? 10 pages on what they need for this room, something like that, Sam. And counties don't have rooms that aren't being used, so I was rearranging everybody else's schedule and on the phone a lot for that. Uh, but we got that. So the DRC was open. When they came to set up the DRC the day before it opened, it takes them eight hours for them to set up the room when I had all the furniture in there. My IT guys already had their, we knew they needed a clean, meaning no firewall on an internet line because they had their own firewall and stuff, but it still took them eight hours to set up. Uh, thank God FEMA was there, but they just have so many rules to get through. Uh, my first day, full day off, Andy, was July 13th. <coughs> that was the first full day I had off work. Now that's not poor Mike. Some of those days I only worked two, three hours, but in fact my sister-in-law who lives in Kettering was not real far from the tornado. She was up and we'd actually went out to supper that night uh, on the 13th. And Julie was up, my wife Tracy, and Julie was, uh, had asked Tracy all kinds of questions earlier in the day. I was somewhere, I wasn't at work, but I was somewhere. She goes, why don't you know anything, Tracy? said, because I haven't seen him. Because <laughs> I literally wasn't home. So I don't know if we have time for questions. What I did have was just some more pictures I'll flip through because I think I am out of time and we'll have the panel, but just some of the, I did not put on purpose, did not put the house on that Mr. Hammond died in. And I did not put, well, somewhere in there was Ashley's house, but I did I would not do a picture of the car in the house. So. But you can see the devastation was, this isn't after it was cleaned up, this was, these houses were gone. In fact, the couple whose car, little ranch style house, no basement, they had an interior bathroom, Ashley and Joey got in the bathroom. The only thing they noticed was again the fan, and the fan came down, they opened, their roof was gone, two of their walls were gone, and they were fine. They had no idea the house was gone. <coughs> There's my information if you...